Welcome to worship with the Universalist Unitarian Church of Peoria. My name is the Reverend Jennifer Innes. It is my joy to be the minister with this congregation of people of all ages at all stages of life. This is a beloved community striving to live into its mission of embracing freedom, loving wholeheartedly, growing in mind, body, and spirit, and adding to the wholeness and the healing of the world. I want to let folks know we are, in case you were wondering, in case you're new, in case you were wondering, we are unapologetically progressive in welcoming people of all ethnicities and races, sexual orientation and gender identities, social and economic situations, abilities, and politics. And we are engaged with the work of our time in the case for human rights and in being good stewards of this earth. In living that mission, we recognize we are part of a deep network of relationships. This is the ancestral home of the Peoria people. They and many other nations were here long before the first European settlers came down the Illinois River. And so we take a moment, as we have been asked to do, to pause in our service and recognize the Peoria people for who they were and for who they are today. I want to thank folks for joining us in person and online. We, we have been learning, we keep learning, how precious it is to be together with people, to expand our circle of care and kindness. So if you are new to us, help us get to know you. We have infinite name tags. We have room for infinite questions, and we might even have some answers. So please come and get to know us. Stay for coffee and conversation after the service. If you're joining us in person, we'll be in Fellowship Hall. You know the patio is kind of nice, too. And if you're on Zoom, stay for that conversation as well. So I want to invite folks as we enter into our service to uh, please turn your respective devices to worship mode, which is silent or buzzy. We recognize that some folks have medical uh, indicators that they need to keep on at all times, so we certainly understand that as well. I have a few notes for today. Uh, so after service today, we have a chance for folks to sign and send postcards uh, to, I think we have, the list is for folks in North Carolina. Uh, this is part of our work with UU The Vote. Uh, part of how we participate in the democratic process is simply to encourage people to show up. Uh, so you're welcome to come and join us in Fellowship Hall. We'll have some tables set up for doing that. Also, we have a couple of notes for the coming week. One, uh, I want to thank all the folks that joined me last Sunday after service for a conversation about choir and music. Uh, so we'll be starting in search for a new choir director and figure out how that looks this fall. But in the meantime, I want to have a little bit, a few moments of singing together uh, with the choir or with a pickup choir, if you will. So I want to invite folks to join me Wednesday evening at 6 here in the sanctuary and then Sunday before service uh, next week. We'll do run through some pieces that are kind of more a cappella and I think easy to just pick up and I think Good for the congregation to pick up as well. Also, next Sunday, I want to invite us to our in-gathering water communion. This is our official start to the congregational year, uh, and we'll welcome all folks from all kinds of places, all the summer travels, and so on. And part of what we do is that we bring a little bit of water from where we have been, no matter far or near. Certainly, the back garden qualifies your rain gauge qualifies, and bring that together as part of our service as a way to kind of express and physically show up for our regathering and our return. Also, next Sunday, as part of our socializing and gathering, we'll be having a potluck. We'll be having some splash games after the service, and I'd love to invite folks to help uh, sign up and be part of making the potluck happen. I'll be kind of organizing that goes on in the kitchen and so on to facilitate this. And please see Regina Stanley uh, if you'd like to be help, helpful. And I think that's it as we get our church year started. And it's good to be together. Can I just say, one of my favorite sounds, the one of my favorite sounds is when I'm walking through the foyer before service and I hear all the people talking. I hear you and the hum 
of that. And it is always beautiful. So thank you. And now let us enter into our service by turning to our first hymn, which is number 40, The Morning Hangs a Signal. Please rise in body or spirit. It's in the gray hymnal if you like to sing with the music. <sighs> Please be seated, and I invite Jean Jost for offering our opening words. As you can probably tell from the title, our reading today is doubly appropriate for the beginning of our church year and for the virtue of hope, which we have recently been discussing. It's called In Our Circle Again by Reverend Sherry Woodbury. Here we are in our circle again, a circle of vision and reflection, a forum for deciding and empowering. Here we are at the base of another bridge, another space spanning the shores of today and tomorrow, beckoning us to cross the chasm one day at a time. Here we are gathered again at the cusp of the future, at the boundary that holds community together. We are here in a circle of love and trust, brought to this moment by a series of choices and promises by hope and gratitude by our own shadows, faced and befriended. With a servant's heart, with a leader's listening, with a parent's love, truer than all our inner trembling, let us model the health we seek for all and lean into community. Somewhere out there, all we dream is possible. 
Somewhere in here, we are sowing the seeds. And I invite Dave Grebner forward for our chalice. Honoring Our Labor by Reverend Florence Kaplow. In recognition of Labor Day, we light this flame to honor all work, including the work of our hands and our backs in gratitude for all the labors that support our world, and for all those who boldly continue to work the work of justice, equity, and peace. mention how much I appreciate hearing the sound of all the people, all the chatting, all the connecting and reconnecting that happens before service. And it just reminds me once again of how much we create this place and this mission together. We are doing this one bit at a time every Sunday, every day of the week, and so on. It is a good gift. And in that spirit, I also recognize how much that all the gifts that we accumulate together, all the gifts freely given, make the congregation and its work possible. So I want to invite us into a moment of offering, of making a financial gift as part of that practice and that recognition. And I also want to add that part of our practice is to share the plate uh, every month, we have a different recipient in the community. So we receive, uh, we offer about half of the undesignated uh, fund into uh, the local community organization for that month. And this month, since it is the first Sunday in September and also the first of September, our new recipient for this month is the Peoria Blooming Check. Bloomington chapter of 100 Black Men of Central Illinois. They started in 2003. They provide services and programs for local African American community, uh, economic seminars, health and wellness fairs, post high school scholarships, and much more. Their Mentoring for Life program helps young people under age 18 forge long term relationships that take care of social, emotional, and cultural needs. It is such an important kind of service into the community that we can do our part to assist. So when the plates come round, please consider giving to, uh, making the part of your gift for the congregation also part of the gift for 100 Black Men of uh, Peoria and Bloomington. And once the plates have passed, there'll be an offering time for lighting candles, what is in your mind and on your heart. And I want to offer that the candles lit are welcome to be part and enjoyed by those who are joining us online as well. And now I invite the ushers to please come forward.
Abraham Heschel reminds us, the prayer invites God to be present in our spirits and our lives. Prayer cannot bring water to a parched land, nor mend a broken bridge, nor rebuild a ruined city. But prayer can water an arid soul, mend a broken heart, and rebuild a weakened will. In this moment, we offer the joys and sorrows of the community. And I want to offer a note for wishes for health. We continue to support the Dearborn family as Sherry is recovering from the strokes and uh, injuries she received while they were visiting family in Colorado. She is making progress, and they're just not going to get back here quite yet, but they will. We continue to wish Sherry a smooth and speedy recovery. And we wish Henry Rakoff a speedy recovery after he was admitted to Proctor Hospital for a fall. And we also offer wishes to his wife, Nancy, and the family as they care for Henry as well. In our both immediate and larger worlds, because this certainly applies to many of us in this congregation, let us keep in our minds and hearts all those who have served in the military, in government offices, and those who are civil servants who continue to work for a better country and a better world. I'll offer, let us hold with us and honor in memory all those who have served and died who have given the ultimate sacrifice. In recognition of Labor Day, as we are honoring this weekend, I offer the words from my colleague, the Reverend Elizabeth Mount. We gather today on a day of rest. Tomorrow is Labor Day, reserved for rest as well, to honor those who work, work and rest, rest and work. The cycle of our lives go round and back and forth sleeping and dreaming, waking and striving. Here, we honor work. We know the community thrives and survives by our shared efforts, and here we also honor rest. We know that the sacred comes to us in moments with when ease and spacious breath give pause to honor the wonder of this world. So here, let us come together in solidarity to honor those whose work built us toward today, to honor all those whose dreams and play and creativity have imagined a better future, to honor the workers who fought for safety regulations, who fought for a weekend, who fought for the eight-hour day, for the rights that made the middle class and a living wage. To honor the workers whose contributions of unpaid labor, of child rearing, cooking, budgeting, domestic tasks of so many types made partners work outside the home become sustainable. We live because of our laboring ancestors. We thrive because of their dreams while at rest. So today, let us take this time to be thankful for the work and the rest. Let us honor all who have come and all who will join in dreams and in the work that is not yet done. So may it be. Let us hold one more moment in shared quiet that we may gather together all the names the milestones, the joys and sorrows that are with us that can be held by this expansive circle of care. Let us hold one more moment in quiet and breathe.
Amen, shalom, shalom, and blessed be. And now I invite Jesse Lachlan forward for our story. The story today is Vote for Our Future by Margaret McNamara and Micah Player. Every two years, on the Tuesday after the first Monday in November, Stanton Elementary School closes for the day. For repairs, a holiday, vacation, nope, Stanton Elementary School closes for election day. Stanton Elementary School is a place where people vote. The reason people vote is to choose who makes the laws of this country. We should all vote, said Latoya. We can't until we turn 18, said Lizzie. What can we do? They looked in books, went online, and even took a trip to their local election office. The kids of Stanton Elementary School got ready. Caddy and her mom handed flyers out. Don't forget to vote, Caddy told one busy dad. I didn't even know there was an election, he said. Can I go with you to vote? Jasmine asked her big sister. It's a pain, her sister said. I'm not even registered, her friend added. It's not hard, said Jasmine. You can do it together. I'll show you how. Nadia and her auntie went door to door. Voting is a right, Nadia said. One lady told them, I don't like standing in lines. I don't either, answered Nadia's auntie. But we can stand in line for coffee. I bet we can stand in line to vote. Hmm. At Jaden's house, the whole family was making their voting plans. I'd walk to that ele election station every year since I could vote, Jaden's great grand told him. But I just can't walk that far anymore. A volunteer can drive you, Jaden said. Mia and Noah and Jamal had a bake sale. Don't forget to vote, Mia said. I'll be away on election day, shrugged one woman. Well, you can vote early, said Mia. Voting, what's the big deal? said a teenager. People fought in wars so we could vote, said Mia. That's a big deal. Why should I vote? said a sad lady. Nothing ever changes. Besides, my one vote won't make a difference. Are you kidding, said Jamal? Changes are made every day because people voted. Every vote counts. And by the time it was the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November, every kid 
in Stanton Elementary School had spread the word. And on election day, voters came all day long. They came with their sons and daughters, their nieces, their nephews, their brothers, their sisters, their cousins, and their friends. On the Wednesday after the first Monday, all the votes had been counted, but the results were so close, they had to be counted again. Some people won and some people lost, and the laws of the country began to change. And the future began to change too. Do not forget to vote. <laughs> I wonder if you think voting is important. I wonder what you can do to help someone else vote. I wonder how we'll get out the vote. I invite the kids to join me for religious education back in the comments. Our reading today is from the Reverend Julian Jamaica Soto. And they say, I know sometimes you get cranky and sometimes your tea gets cold before you can drink it. Sometimes the news is too much. The resistance seems too little. That's real. But we are here imperfect and together and reaching. You can hold my hand if you want. I washed it with soap. It's okay. In this kind of time, now is better than later. Now I love you. Now I am sorry it hurts. Now I witness your struggle and mine. Sometimes one answer is to be a yes in the face of every no. I am a yes for you. Now and again and later if you need me. Here ends the reading. Please join me in singing our hymn. Number 159, this is my song.
So my central questions for today include, why is voting so essential? Why is voting so essential? And what is a human right? What is a human right? And with those questions, I want to start with a story about labor and one of the most, what I think is one of the most important speeches in our national conversation this year. It was during the Democratic National Convention and up on the stage amidst all the people that were all kind of shiny and polished and professional looking came a gentleman with a serious, wicked bullet. You know, business in the front, party in the back, hair. And a button-down shirt and short sleeves. And a real comfort for being there and thinking, I, I get to speak in this moment. And his name is John Russell. He is a content creator, he is a journalist, he is an unapologetic socialist. He's a following on national media and he was brought to our national attention at the convention. He's a cisgender, able-bodied gentleman and a self-described dirtbag journalist with a Substack uh, newsletter, email newsletter um, called The Holler. And he describes it as class politics for rednecks and hippies. And he's a so, someone who is a committed, committed advocate for the people from Appalachia. And from what I've also seen, he is someone who is genuinely curious about what people think about the nature of their lives, their opinions, their choices, and so much more. So his also was one of the shorter speeches of this moment at about two and a half minutes, blazing fast relative to all the talking that happened, right? But he also did not do what many others did. He did not just tell his story and advocate for the candidate. He didn't do that. He told a powerful story of the people and started a conversation about class and respecting labor and the failure of the political system to be a voice for the working class, for those whose labor keeps the lights on for the people who depend on them and the communities that exist and care for those workers. John Russell made no bones about talking about the people who had given up their lives and their lungs for the work in the mines that powered our country. How both political part, both political parties, all the political parties had failed the people because of the consistent choice for money and power over health and life. He called out the technique by, used by so many officials over time that we have seen for hundreds of years, I will say, that appeal to people's fears by setting them against one another to separate people who might find common cause. As Russell said, populism that insists we are too different to get along is just divide and conquer by a different name. He goes on to say that there is another populism deeply grounded in the fight of workers for pay and hours and safety. It is found in, in the investment in infrastructure that has happened in over the past 100 years and there to take care of all the people and ensure life and liberty.
in that conversation, I am thinking about the nature of rights, how we define them, how we understand ourselves as human. I think this is his deeper call to us, is how we understand ourselves as human beings and the structures we create to survive and often what we create to try to survive each other and even to thrive in the effort to create a more perfect union. So the question on this Labor Day weekend in this presidential election year is not only our right to vote, which is, which is still in some ways a question for so many people, but what is behind our understanding of rights as individuals, what it means for each of us to be human, to say what it is, what our what we should hold fast to as part of our lives, and also how that microcosm of us connects with the macrocosm of our founding as a country, our struggle since then to preserve the republic, to create and keep going with the work that is a democratic society. This is a spiritual and existential as well as a moral question. So I looked at the definition of human rights and found one from the Equality and Human Rights Commission in Great Britain. Human rights are the basic rights and freedoms that belong to every person in the world from birth to death. They apply regardless of where you are from, what you believe, or how you choose to live your life. They can never be taken away, though they can be somewhat restricted. If a person breaks a law or in the interests of national security, they offer, for example. And the basic rights are based in shared values, such as dignity, fairness, equality, respect, and independence. So we have in this country our own Bill of Rights, and it was created, I appreciate uh, drawing again from Richard Haas's The Bill of Obligations, that book that was recommended to me by the book group last fall. It is an ongoing source of information and reflection. And in the first part of the book, Richard Haas takes on, kind of summarizes the founding of the country, that they, the guys in the wigs, the guys in the funny hair, they sat around and created this system of government that was trying to balance liberty and, and relationship and economics and all the political forces that were happening all those years ago and created this structure. And the people also realized, yes, now you have a government, but we still actually needed something that said what the individual rights are about as a good balance for the government structure. And thus was created the Bill of Rights, the first 10, which talk about freedom from religion, the freedom of speech, freedom of assembly. And also, I kind of like that last one, the, the 10th one, which was that you, you don't get to, whatever else we don't cover, all the rights, the, the government gets to do what the government is supposed to do, and that's it. It doesn't abrogate the rights of the state or the rights of the individual. And since then, those rights have been expanded with any number of additional amendments about voting, for example, of many. And I like the last one. I was kind of going through this. And I like the last one is congressional pay raises. Did you know that? The last one was about congressional pay raises. There you go. We know in our lives and in our economies and in our conduct of the world that enshrining rights and government structure is merely the beginning. These words put down on paper that make these declarations certainly are good. They are certainly good tools. And it's 
really all about the practice as well and discovering how it all works or doesn't work together. But that's not where it stops either. The Richard Haas also would add to this conversation that it's not simply saying, yes, we know we need to do the work, but really some specific commitments about being involved with this work. He would propose that along with the Bill of Rights is a Bill of Obligations. A commitment, specific commitments to effort, to create, to keep creating. And I think part of this effort, part of this work, is we can locate this in a theological way by understanding that our sense of human dignity, that maybe a core value of that dignity is there, but how much that keeps needing to be a practice, how much our everyday moments keep demanding the practice of it from us, that we need to be witness to not just our humanity, but our neighbor's humanity. That we need to know ourselves and what we need to be human. The work here is existential and real. It is seen. It is known with a system that treats us as human beings. We have some deep challenges in this practice. We get in our own way so often. Simply with bias, simply with prejudice, simply with learned judgment of one another, how much that has kept people from being allowed to vote. You know, the founding fathers didn't, you know, they didn't include women in that. They didn't regard anybody but the white landowners in this conversation. So clearly there was work that needed to be done. And that reflected what was going on in society, what continues to be a reflection in this moment, too. We are still in that work of seeing people of all, seeing every person as having a voice and a vote and agency. Hundreds of years later, we are still in that work. But we also get in our own way, as John Russell pointed out, with being convinced of certain forms of populism that would make us fear others. Even when we would have more in common with the people we are told to fear. We get in our own way because of, gosh, you know, lack of attention. I mean, we have daily lives. I mean, I have children to feed. We want to maintain a place to live. We have daily stuff that comes up. And it's so frustrating to have to keep coming back to work, especially that felt like it was resolved. I know one of our conversations in the last several years have been, didn't this get answered? Didn't this work resolve certain questions? I'm, particularly for me, it's around women and gender and agency. Didn't that get sorted out so long ago? And yet, I can point to a moment in 2010 when there was, I was serving in, the current, in a congregation in Fort Worth and some legislative effort in another part of the country to limit women's access to, I think, health care or, or even like job. I think it was very much gender based. I tell you, when I heard about that, I can remember standing in the pulpit and feeling the hearing of that. How much that was kind of this chill down my spine, that this was the beginning of more to come to undermine access and agency for women of all kinds of ways. I had just before performed 
my first memorial for that ministry in Fort Worth was for a woman, a member who was 95. She was one of the eldest members of the congregation. And in the service, as I had looked at her life, I pointed out in the memorial that how she was a child when the 19th Amendment was ratified when the vote for women was added to the rights. We are still learning how to use and safeguard that right, along with still learning how to see women as fully human and fully equal. And we still need to be on top of the work and not assume comfort. Oh, can I tell you how irritating that is? Can I get an amen? I want to be done with some of this work. Yes? Yes, we want to be done. Urgh. Nope. Nope. So here we have Labor Day and you, you, the vote, in case you're wondering. We still need to be on top of the work and not assume comfort, even when we have benefited. For those of us who have benefited from long, long privilege, it is not done. And I think we get in our way when we don't take our neighbors seriously, too. I so appreciate whenever I see journalists who truly have a curious and compassionate conversation with people who have talked about how much they struggle, how much they fear. Not to call people stupid or irresponsible or, oh, they just don't know, not to dismiss but to be genuinely curious. I think that's part of our practice, right, of honoring the human. I think we also can feel so much defeat in this moment. How many systems just limit us, how much it's too big to even deal with. I appreciate Richard Haas's point on some of this, that the founding documents of the United States were meant for like this many people, not over 400 million. Okay, kind of, kind of the scale just gives me a little moment of comic relief here. Like, yeah, I don't, so the Adams and the Jefferson and the Hamilton and the Franklin, they didn't, they didn't have this, they didn't know. They didn't have this forecast. They just didn't know even as brilliant as they were. So our system is challenging by itself. And then we bring in intentional disenfranchisement to cut people from the ability to vote, to use economic pressures to further take people away from the opportunity to live, to be able to organize, to be able to have the energy to do anything but survive. You know, how many people just here in Peoria are not going to vote because it's, it's too hard, they can't figure out how, or they don't, or really the most important reason, but they don't see any reason to do it? Who speaks for them? What John Russell was calling out, or Richard Haas names as a concern, you're saying the people have been systematically undercut to think that there is nothing, that this is meaningless to their lives, and they're not going to just, they're just simply not even going to try because they can't. It is, and Russell and Richard Haas particularly also put, point out the economics, the systemic economic oppression for all people is really undercut our sense of power in voting. It is a form of generational class oppression. And if you amplify that by the gerrymandering of political parties choosing to cut voting lists in the name of eliminating fraud, it doesn't happen. Laws across the country that make it harder to stay in line to vote. You are polling places and so much more. What a deep undercutting this project is. Our time for each of us is so limited and so small. Our time is just so defined 
And yet, as Unitarian theologian James Luther Adams reminds us, our call is to take time seriously, the time that we have to take ourselves seriously, even when deeply the feeling of deep defeat. Those of us who have had privilege, I think even those of us who have had privilege are feeling this as well, this powerlessness, this when choices seem to be taken away and are in fact taken away. Let us learn from that feeling. I know it's for the past few years, especially the past, I don't know, decade, whatever your window is, how much there's been this grinding down of the spirit and not knowing how to proceed. Is it, an, is it worth the effort to be human? But even though those political machines, some of which have been making plans and putting them in, face for, in place for 40 years, even though that's been happening, this does not mean the completion of that project is inevitable. I think in the last few weeks, what has shown up is a sense of enough. Enough of the ugly, enough of the dismantling of civility, enough of dismantling our civil structure, enough of behavior that would have disqualified leaders in the past because they deeply disrespected what we hold and value. In short, enough. And now it's time to do something. We are going to have, we have profound disagreement on policy, economics, structures, and laws. And still, however, we have more in common than we have differences about a sense of rights about humanity. We are tired of being weary. And now, Maybe enough of us are saying enough that we can find some hope. I'm not saying it's sunshine and rainbows. But it's enough to get us to move and not let our spirit be entirely defeated. We are more than our broken hearts, as enormous as that is. We want the rights and we won't let them pass. Do not assume defeat and do not assume victory. Let us take this moment seriously as it is needed and go forth, remembering that we are, in fact, fully human, that we do have right to life, liberty, and I like that pursuit of happiness. We should give it a try, maybe some joy at the very least, yes? Let's do that. Let us go forth and recommit and follow through on our work, being fully human, and our liberation that brings love and joy and connection and possibility to each other and to the world. Amen. Please rise, embody your spirit, and join us for singing hymn number 131, Love Will Guide Us.
from Reverend Peggy Clark, knowing how quickly the flame of truth may be extinguished, how easily the chalice of fellowship broken, let us be vigilant in faith, keep peace in our hearts, and make care for one another. The watchword of our lives together, so our light goes out everywhere into the world. And now, may we have faith in life to do wise planting that the generations to come may reap even more abundantly than we. May we be bold in bringing to fruition the golden dreams of human kinship and justice. This we ask, that the fields of promise become fields of reality. It is for us to start and do. Our worship is ended. Let our service begin. Ha, 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 ha. 